going to be talking today about trading unusual options activity, and this is the best way that I know how for a retail trader to get themselves to trade more like an institutional trader, because what is the main difference between the two? Well, one statistically has a much more difficult time of making money in the long run, and one of them statistically makes money all the time. And we want to figure out what the differences are between the ways that institutional traders trade and retail traders trade that makes that disparity so obvious. So just before we get started here so I can get a baseline of where everyone is, how many of you out there have never ever heard of unusual options activity before, either as a concept or trading strategy on CNBC or Bloomberg, read about it online? How many of you have never heard of this idea before? Who, who is coming into this completely blind with no knowledge of it? I wouldn't be surprised if there was more than a, a few people where that was the case because <clears throat> this type of trading, while becoming more prevalent and much more discussed, is still not a you know really uh, prevalent or um, common way that people look at equity options trading. So before we get started here, um, I want to read our standard boilerplate risk disclaimer here. Day trading, short term trading, options trading, and futures trading are extremely risky undertakings. They generally are not appropriate for someone with limited capital, little or no trading experience, and or a low tolerance for risk. All trading operations involve serious risks and you can lose your entire investment. No trades or recommendations or advice, and we cannot be sued for losses of capital. All trades are for educational purposes only. Please contact your broker or registered investment advisor for execution margin and all other capital requirement questions. Everyone watching this presentation here, so all disclaimers on optionhacker.com and alphashark.com. So <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about myself too much uh, after that intro, but my name is James Romelli. I actually trade equities and equity options here with uh, unusual options activity, driving probably 90% of all of my trade setups. I am regularly on Bloomberg, CNBC, Fox Business, BNN Canada. If you want to watch me on Bloomberg next week, you can. I will be on um, at least once, and I'll be on BNN in Canada on Monday. But I also write for Futures Mag, Active Trader Mag, Resource Investor Mag, and seen the Open Markets Magazine. If you haven't seen me on TV, maybe you've read something I've written in the past. But we're here today to talk about unusual options activity, and I truly believe that tracking unusual options activity and equity options order flow in the market is the best way to answer this problem. It's the solution to this problem, and the problem is 90% of all retail traders lose money. Why is that? Most institutions make money. Why is that? And the difference in the performance that we tend to see between institutional traders and um, Retail traders really boils down to the advantages and the ways that both groups of people drive their edge. Now, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about why institutions have more edge than me. Why do I even care about finding and honing in on institutional equity options order flow? Well, the truth is institutions have more edge than me, and there's really nothing I can do to try and compete with them in the categories that they are gaining an advantage in me uh, over me in right so let's first talk about information <clears throat> how many of you out there believe that on the institutional level so meaning you know at big hedge funds at big banks that have prop desks <clears throat> that there is very little to no insider trading going on meaning traders are only making decisions based on public information that everyone else has and there's no funny business or anything suspicious happening they're not doing any type of insider trading everything is on the level and they're playing the game in the perfectly legal and inside of regulations way right so everybody yeah and that's all the most common response when I say it, that is usually something that people say you know no that's laughable the very idea of that happening is laughable right because we know that it happens all the time these guys get yeah want to buy a bridge exactly right these guys get in trouble all of the time for insider trading right so it definitely is a way that they drive their edge now unfortunately you know as someone who wants to uh, play by the rules and stay out of jail I can't do that like they do, right? But let's assume for just one second here that that isn't something that's happening, that that's not a dynamic um, uh, <clears throat> of institutional trading at all. Then where do they get the rest of their edge? Because not every single institutional trader out there is, you know, placing all of his trades based on what the VP, his VP buddy at Kraft said at the country club this weekend. But 
a lot of them have edge that is driven inherently just by the structure and size of their fund or the vehicle that they're trading with. And that all comes from the amount of capital that they have. They have so much more money than me that it drives their advantages in these three other areas, manpower, technology, and information. How many hours a week do you guys say you spend outside of regular market hours either going over setups, looking at charts, reading articles about stocks that you might be interested in, um, coming to presentations like this so you can learn more uh, about trade ideas and new ways to approach things, looking at company financials, anything that you would consider quote unquote homework outside of market hours. Some of you might spend 10 hours, some might spend 20. So I've even had people tell me that they spend 60 hours a week outside of market hours doing research and trying to better themselves as traders. And that's a lot of time. And that's obviously someone who just lives and breathes financial markets. But what's really unfortunate is that no matter what you do, you're always going to be limited by the fact that you are just one person. And you're not going to be able to do as much research, as much analysis, as much um, kind of consuming of information as a whole team of analysts and quants at a hedge fund are going to be able to do. You're always going to be limited by that fact, right? So it says information overload all your time. Right, so yeah, you, Wayne here says he spends pretty much all of his time, and that's really fantastic. That's going to give you an advantage, but unfortunately, you can't spend as much time or as many man hours as a hedge fund is able to in analyzing even just the publicly available information that's out there, right? There's just too much. You also don't have access to the same technology that they do, right? A lot of their edge is also driven just by the market mechanics and the ways that they're able to get access over regular retail traders like me. Because just like you guys, I am a retail trader. I execute my orders through Thinkorswim or through interactive brokers. I use a retail trading platform, and all the tools that I use are readily available to any retail trader. But institutions have proprietary things. They have access to technology that we simply don't. And then finally, we come up to information. You know, the amount of information that they're able to consume because of the technology and manpower that they have is far greater than anything I can ever hope to achieve, right? So if we consider that fact without even thinking about the idea of insider trading or the idea that they oftentimes do have non-public information, we can see that hedge funds and institutional traders have an inherent advantage over um, the retail guy, right? And you might look at this and say, okay, well, what am I supposed to do about that? How can I possibly ever hope to uh, compete with them if I can't compete with them on any even one of these uh, categories that they gather edge in. But none of that really matters when I come to the realization that all of that really ends up as is a trade idea, right? All of the information that comes into the quote unquote hedge fund machine or institutional trading machine gets analyzed, processed, and the end result or idea that they get is always just going to be a trade. So if I'm able to find this, if I'm able to see the trade idea that they generate after doing all of this work, it doesn't really matter that I can't compete with them on this level, right? That doesn't really matter. What matters is that I'm able to see the end result of their hard work. So my main goal is not to try and compete with them on this stuff, right? I can't. There's no way. There's no way for me to compete with them in these categories. So I have to focus my energy and efforts on identifying the trades that they come up with after doing all this work. And we do that one way and one way only, and that is by tracking, oops, by tracking unusual options activity. So what is unusual options activity? Well, this activity is order flow in the underlying options market that is driven by institutional traders. And simply put, any unusual option activity order is an order that has a volume greater than the average daily volume in the given stock, right? So if I know that a stock trades 5,000 equity options contracts in total on average per day, and I see a block of 10,000 out of the money calls being bought, what do I know right away? I know that that's unusual options activity. And I also know just by the sheer size of the type of the order flow that we're looking for, that that order flow is driven by institutional traders because there's not very many guys sitting at home in their basement on their laptop, you know, using their trading platform to sling 10,000 lots of options, 5,000 lots of options. I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are a few re 
you know, traders at home that trade in size that would make your head spin. But generally speaking, whenever we see this type of order flow, we can assume that it's coming from some type of institution. But it gives us insight into where it is they see opportunity in the market at any given time, right? I can take a look at a day like today or a day like yesterday where the market is getting sold off hard and aggressively, and I can see where institutional money is coming in and looking for value. I can see, okay, on a day like today where the market is down a lot, where are institutional derivatives traders coming in and putting on big bullish bets? Where are they pressing bearish bets on a day like this? It gives me a lot of insight into where institutional money is going, and it lets me as a retail trader track this quote-unquote smart money, right? And even though we know that hedge funds are not really, you know, always outperforming the market, it's still really important for me to see that momentum of money flow and see exactly where institutional traders are placing their bets because in general, derivatives traders, I believe, are a more savvy trader and I care about where they're placing their bets. So why is this something that only works in options? People ask me this all the time. How come we can't do this in stock, in underlying stock? You know, I don't really want to trade options. I'm not an options guy. How come I can't just look at the order flow in stock and determine where big money is placing unusually large bets? How come I can't do this in futures? And the answer to that is because of dark pools. Does anybody here not know what a dark pool is? Who has never ever heard of a dark pool? <clears throat> Probably a few people, but a dark pool is simply a center of off exchange liquidity where two parties can come and transact with each other and they can trade stock there. And it's perfectly legal, right? If me and Wayne um, want to make a trade with each other in, uh, <clears throat> you know, while we're sitting on a uh, the patio here outside of the exchange having a beer, we can do that, right? I'm an owner of stock. He's an interested buyer. We can transact on this off exchange way and do business together. And this is how the vast majority of institutional equities get traded, right? They trade in a way that makes it completely impossible for the average retail trader to actually find out where money is flowing in the underlying equity. Citadel is a huge, huge HFT shop and market maker here in Chicago. Their office is down the street from ours, right here in the financial district. By the first hour of, the, of trading every single day, they've already traded more stock in their dark pool than the New York Stock Exchange will trade all day long. Right, so I know that if I'm trying to find where institutional money is being pushed in stocks, I'm only seeing a fraction or the tip of the iceberg when I look at order flow on the NYSE or the Amex or the Chicago Stock Exchange, right? So I have to find a way to get around that, and the best way that I know how is by looking at the equity options market. So in order to understand that, we kind of have to understand the process of which orders go down. So a trader is going to come up with an idea. An institution says, all right, here we know uh, X, Y, and Z. Let's do this trade and um, uh, buy this big block of out-of-the-money calls. Once they make that decision, they're going to call their broker. Their broker is going to shot that order all over the place to market makers off the floor, on the floor, other counterparties that might be interested. And if they can't find a buyer or if they can't find someone to take the other side of the trade there, the broker may choose to trade it themselves. What's really important is that at no point throughout this process do they have the ability to send that order to a dark pool for options because there is no dark pool for options. Okay? Every single equity options order that they do, no matter how large it is or small, has to be routed through a public options exchange. Right, and we know of a, a you know there's a bunch of them: the CBOE, the Philex, the NYSE, the uh, the Boston uh, Stock Exchange, the Miami Options Exchange. Right, there's a bunch. So there's a lot of different places that they can send this order flow. But what's really important to understand, and the key to the entire trading plan, is that no matter where in the country or which exchange this order gets filled at. The exchange must provide the general trading public with all of the pertinent information surrounding that trade. Okay, so what we're able to get out of the options market is a wealth of information about a big block of options that has come across the tape. So take a look here at an example in SYNA. And I don't want you to pay too much attention to the format or the colors that we have here because this is how it gets spit out. This is what it looks like uh, using a scanner that we have. But 
you can get this information in pretty much any retail trading platform. You can get it uh, from a number of other scanners that are available online. Like I said, we have a scanner as well. But what's important to understand and important to take away from this is that this is the information that the exchange must give you about a trade. This is all the pertinent info tied to this trade that I then use to make a decision on whether or not this is a trade I'm actually interested in following along with with institutional money. So I can see when the trade took place, I can see whether it was bought or sold, the size of the trade, the symbol, expiration, um, I can see the strike price, whether it was a call or a put, the price it traded, and I can see the market at the time of the trade, I can see whether it was an opening or closing position, and I can also see where the stock was trading when the options trade took place. Now all of this information uh, might seem like a lot, and it might seem like a lot to analyze, but I can see a couple of very important things right away. What I can see is that this trader paid a dollar and eighty-one cents for this trade, right? A dollar and eighty-one cents at a time when the market was one ten at one eighty. So what does that tell me right away? It tells me that they paid through the offer. The market maker's best offer was a dollar eighty, and this trader said, "You know what? I want to get this one thousand one hundred and fifty-seven." Uh, lot of calls so badly that I'm going to pay more than what the market maker is offering right now. So what does that tell me about the trade? What does it tell me? Does it tell me this was an aggressive or passive buyer of these options? Was this trader really asked to come out and get these things? Or did they just kind of say, yeah, all right, we'll work an order and, and see if we get a fill? No, they were very aggressively trying to buy these. And what I'm trying to do is find orders where this number, the volume, is unusual, where it's an unusually large amount of options to trade for a, uh, a for a particular symbol in a day. And what we can see here is that what this tells me right away is it's a 7.4 times usual volume. Now, if any of you trade with Thinkorswim, you actually already have access to an equity option scanner. Uh, Thinkorswim has a scanner, and they actually have a way to flag unusual volume that they call the sizzle index, which I uh, should have time to show you guys at the end here. But this is the type of order flow and information that we're able to glean from the equity options market. So how do we actually take that and turn it into an actionable trade idea, right? This might not seem like a large order. Well, let's take a look at one that really does. So this order happened um, in PMCS just a few days before uh, the takeover announcement was made. So I don't know if, if any of you follow PMCS, you know that this stock is trading considerably higher than this now. But this tape, uh, this trade hit the tape midday against open interest of only 318 contracts and it was a $1.25 million bet. Right, two days before a big announcement was made in the stock. Now, what does this tell me right away? The sheer size of this trade being a $1.25 million bet tells me that what? Who was most likely on the other side of the, uh, who's most likely the initiator of this trade? Some institution or someone else, right? It's clearly an institutional trade. And it's clearly someone who is willing to bet a very large sum of capital that this stock is above $7 in January of 2016. Well, we flagged this as unusual right away, right? Huge bet, it's over a million dollars. You would be surprised just how infrequently you see trades this large in individual um, equities. And when I say infrequently, I mean relative to um, you know the total number of trades that happen in a day, right? We see unusual order flow like this pretty much on a daily basis, but it's about determining which is the most actionable. So take a look here at what happened in PMCS. Two days later, so this is the day that they bought the that they bought these calls, right? Two days later, the announcement is made that PMCS is going to be acquired in an all cash deal, and the stock gaps to the upside, right? These calls explode in value and start tra and, uh, trade that day as high as $3.33 in that session, meaning that this trader made $3.6 million in just two days, right? If, as a smaller retail trader, if I would have bought a 20 lot of these calls, I would have profited $4,900 and $1,700 worth of risk. Now, looking at the situation here and looking at the way that this trade went down, who out there thinks that this trader just got lucky? Who thinks that this is just the luckiest trader in the world? And that, yeah, right, I'm being funny again. Right, I'm being funny again, I know. So um, what we have here is a pretty blatant example of a trade. Yeah, he was lucky enough to get the inside info. There you go. That's That's 
a, um, a, a great way to look at it, right? What we have here is a pretty blatant example of how a institutional trader may come in with some type of knowledge of a deal going down and put on a very large equity options bet. Now, a lot of people are going to ask me why, you know, why do they do this? Isn't, you know, if I can figure it out, can't the SEC? And we're going to talk a little bit about why, even though they know that the SEC probably does see this as suspicious, why they don't really care and why they're going to keep doing it no matter what, right? But you would think that this type of action doesn't happen quite that often where we have this massive, blatantly obvious equity options order ahead of a big catalyst event like this, but it actually happens quite often, far more often than um, you might think initially. So let's take a look at another example here from this, this year, and this was in Kraft, and this is probably the most, ooh, I don't know why those drawings stayed. This is probably the most blatant example of insider trading that I have ever seen in my entire life, and you have not heard anything yet from the SEC about what these guys, or if, if anyone is going to get in trouble for doing this. Well, what we have here is an order that came across the tape on March 10th. So this is a little earlier in this year. 5,000 of the Kraft June 67 half calls were bought for 40 cents on the, um, uh, an, as an opening position when the market was 30 bid at 40 bid. So what we have here is a, um, uh, what we have here is a, big, big block of craft options with a pretty aggressive out-of-the-money uh, strike. We're going to look and see where the stock was trading when they put this trade on. But what does this order tell us, right? And this is only one block of several blocks in equal size in craft that came across this day. What it tells us is that someone out there is expecting craft to have a pretty significant move to the upside. On March 10th, these options, you know, have a few months left to expiration, but it's a pretty aggressive bet in craft. Now, what do you guys think the general options dynamics are like in craft? Do you guys think that the craft options markets are ones that are seeing massive amounts of trading happening in them all the time, right? Are there huge speculative derivatives bettors coming in and, you know, putting on aggressive out-of-the-money options bets? You know, is that because Kraft moves so much? Is it a momentum name that swings around a lot? No. And that's a pretty great way to describe it there, Rick. They're pretty sleepy markets. Kraft market's pretty quiet, right? We see this happen all the time. And what it does is it flags us a signal here when we say, hey, you know what, it's a pretty quiet market in general. Um, why would a trader be coming in and doing an order this large? And yes, it might be a hedge, right? They may be doing it as a hedge. And we're going to talk about ways to determine whether or not an order is more likely to be a hedge or a speculative bet in a little bit. But Watch what happened to the stock here after this order took place, and it becomes pretty apparent why they did this trade. Well, this is an old chart because the new, uh, the new company trades under the ticker KHC, but Kraft announced a merger with HNZ about 10 days later, and the stock exploded to the upside. Kraft said they're going to pay a special dividend of like $16, I think it was, to all of their shareholders, and the stock explodes. Right, the new company is going to become one of the largest food conglomerates in the world, and this trader collects millions in profits, tens of millions in profits. When it was all said and done, this block of options and some of the other ones that traded that day netted this trader over $40 million in about 10 days. And anyone that would have purchased these options for $0.40 cents would have had an opportunity to sell them for above $22 um, after the announcement was made. Right, So I can ask you guys the exact same question. I can be funny again and say, hey... <laughs> Again, in this situation, do you guys think that this trader knew that this deal was going to happen, or did they just get lucky? Right? And again, it's pretty obvious that they knew that this deal was going to happen. And in deals this large, oftentimes there are parties that will know what's going to happen, that are willing to go out there and trade on it. And that's kind of one of the big underlying upsides to trading unusual options activity, is that a lot of hedge fund traders and bigger traders, activist investors, have more information than us. Most of them do, right? A lot of them have access to information that is non-public. And humans, by nature, can be greedy. It's something that we see happening all the time. People always say to me, how come they still do this knowing that it looks this suspicious? Well, somebody said it earlier uh, in the chat box here, right? Because they know that if they get caught, no one's going to jail, right? They're going to have 
to pay some type of penalty. And there's a line that institutions love when they are in trouble for stuff like this. And they say, without admitting or denying guilt, we accept the penalty. And then that's it. It's a slap on the wrist, right? And when we look at the way that these options markets trade, you would think that the SEC and the regulators would catch more of this, but they really don't. A study was published about a year uh, and a half or so ago, maybe two years ago, that said, hey, um, we took a look at all of the M&A deals that went down over the past however much time. Right? They looked at a big chunk of time, looked at options markets, looked at M&A deals, and said that they arrived at the conclusion that ahead of M&A, 25% to 30% of the time, there's going to be some type of equity option signal or order flow like PMCS, like Kraft, that is going to signal the move higher, right? So what does that tell you? How many times in a year are there M&A deals that go down? So that means that one out of every four times we're in a situation where someone is using equity options to make a bet with information that they're not supposed to have. But let's again assume for a second that that doesn't happen, that there isn't anyone out there that's being dishonest at retail, um, you know, that um, institutional traders in general are following the regulations that they're supposed to. Do I still care about the order flow if that was the case? Well, I absolutely do. Activist investors like Carl Icahn, David Einhorn, uh, Ackman, Dan Loeb, those guys use the equity options markets to lever themselves into a position. They wedge themselves into a stock using options before announcing that they're taking a, a stake in the company. But one of the things, uh, does the SEC subscribe to Option Hacker? They should. And, you know, it's really interesting for me to, to think about the amount of, uh, you know, surveillance analysts and um, compliance officers that the exchanges themselves employ, and yet still all of this stuff gets, you know, basically done without without any type of uh, punishment coming through for these guys. Right? Now, you might hear about it in, in, in the future, right? It, we may find out a year from now that they had been investigating the craft trader for the past year and they finally have proof that he had insider information because one it you know unless the SEC or the regulating bodies that control these markets have definitive proof that someone knew a piece of information and then used it to trade well they can't actually do anything about it right but all of the trades that come across the tape as soon as they hit the tape, become public information. And anyone can use that information to make a decision and then turn that into an actionable trade for themselves. right? So I don't really care where the information is coming from, what reason these traders are putting these trades on. All I want to do is focus in on the suspicious looking speculative order flow and then trade right along with the institution. Because they're betting a lot of money on something happening, I want to do the same thing with them. Okay, so we're about to jump into the actual step-by-step -step trading plan here for analyzing these orders and setups. Before I do, does anyone have any questions about anything that we've talked about so far? Anything at all? Anything at all? If not, we'll jump right into uh, the trading plan here. So I'll leave plenty of time at the end to take questions as well. So <clears throat> everything great? Good. So I have to have a trading plan in place to analyze order flow. If I don't, I'm going to make my head swim trying to watch all the stuff come across the tape. I have to have a way to determine whether or not something warrants my further investigation or if it's something that I need to take a pass on and, and wait for the next thing to come across. That's because there's a ton of information that needs to be digested when watching the tape, right? So here's one of the scanners that is available to, to anybody that wants to get it. This is not the, um, uh, how are you going to know if it's a, not a hedge? We're going to talk about that, Steve. <clears throat> so here we have um, all of the order flow that has come across so far today. And not every single one of these trades is unusual option activity. They're just large. Just because a trade is large doesn't necessarily mean that it's unusual. But take a look at all of this. And today is actually a pretty slow day in volume, right? That's a ton. How am I going to go through all of those? And focus on the orders that are the best speculative bets that have the best chance of working out based on what the institutional trader <clears throat> has as his underlying belief. And I do this by analyzing it with <clears throat> a step-by-step -step trading plan. And we call it our Oak Ribbit trading plan. I know it's not the most eloquent name around, but 
it's a way for me to go through these orders and analyze them the exact same way every single time to determine whether or not they're actionable. So let's go through this uh, plan step by step. Um, <clears throat> It stands for Open Interest Chart Risk Reward Break Even Time and Target, and all of these are metrics that I'm going to evaluate to determine whether or not an order is actionable. So let's take a look at the PMCS trade here um, using the Oak Ribbit Trading Plan and determine whether or not this was a trade because we already know that it worked out really well. But was the information there when it came across the tape to make a determination that it was an actionable alert? Right. So I use the Oak Ribbit Trading Plan to analyze this order and determine whether or not I actually want to take this trade. And what I first need to do is determine whether or not the trade is an opening position. Right. Just because an order is a buy doesn't necessarily mean that <clears throat> it is an opening position. Traders sell options naked all of the time, and so do institutions. And then to exit them, they buy them back. So I either need to see a trade labeled as opening or I can use open interest and volume to make a determination on my own. Let's say that this wasn't labeled opening, and not every opening trade is going to be labeled explicitly because exchanges, not every single one of them allows for a trader to do that, and brokers don't necessarily always do what they're supposed to and label the trades appropriately. So how can I check and know for sure that a trade is an opening position and make sure that I'm entering when a trader enters and not when they exit? And I can do that by looking at volume and open interest. So open interest... <clears throat> <clears throat> needs to be smaller than volume for me to determine that it is an opening trade. I told you guys in the previous slide that the open interest in this was 318 contracts when this order came across the tape, yes? So with 318 contracts in open interest, is it at all possible that 14,726 contracts constitute a, a closing order? No, absolutely not. It's not actually possible because there isn't enough there for them to close. So if I can flag this as a volume being greater than open interest position or trade, then I know for a fact that it is an opening position. There's no way for it to be closing. If I can't determine with a 100% certainty that a position is opening, I cannot take the trade. Right. So that rules out a whole bunch of uh, you know signals that come across the tape in a day right off of the bat. It only is going to have me doing any type of further analysis on a position that is opening, okay? So I want to trade the biggest opening orders that I can, and I want to see the ratio of volume over open interest as large as possible. What's more significant, 20,000 contracts being bought against open interest of 15,000 contracts or 5,000 contracts being bought against open interest of zero? What's the more significant trade? Which one do you guys think is the most, the more interesting setup? Which one would warrant further investigation more over the other, right? The smaller order. So the smaller order against zero open interest is by far the more interesting trade because it's much more significant relative to the interest that is already there in the contra in, in that line of contracts, right? So after I make a determination on that it is in fact an opening position, I then need to make a best estimate of whether or not the trade is a hedge or a speculative bet. And I can do this <clears throat> using a chart, right? So the chart is one of the most important tools that I have probably right behind uh, my actual tape. The Ichimoku Cloud is a chart indicator that we use that is actually really simple and very easy to use and particularly useful in this type of trading plan because it allows me to do very fast analysis of different types of orders that are coming across the tape. And it's going to look kind of intimidating for those of you that have never seen it before. Has anyone here never ever seen the Ichimoku Cloud before? Has no idea what it looks like? Has never used it before? That's something that is probably a little bit more uh, mysterious than the concept of unusual options activity. But what we're going to look at here is going to look pretty intimidating off the bat. There's a lot going on. There's a ton of stuff on the chart, but it's actually a really simple indicator to read. It basically is just going to tell me at a single glance whether or not a stock is in bullish, neutral, or bearish territory. And then I can match that up with the order that I have and determine whether or not it's more likely for the order to be a speculative bet or a hedge. Okay? So the first thing that I do is I look at a chart with the assumption that in general, traders on the institutional side are trading with momentum, that they're not coming in and trying to fade 
moves in the market, that they're trading with momentum, and that really is the case. The majority of funds that are using derivatives are momentum traders, right, momentum funds. So what I have to do is determine at any given time what the trend is telling me. And as you can see here, there's a lot of stuff going on on this chart, but the shaded area that we have, the Ichimoku cloud, this is what's going to tell me whether or not we're trading in bullish or bearish territory, or if it's a little bit more of a neutral setup. Anything below the cloud is in bearish territory. Anything above it is in bullish territory. Anything inside of it is in neutral territory. And this line is actually misplaced here. I already showed you guys the day that these traded. So this is the day that those traded. What can I make a determination on with this chart about PMCS? Is PMCS setting up in a bearish trend right now? Given the price action that we've seen in PMCS on this chart here, is it set up in a bearish trend or is it breaking out of that bearish trend and approaching a very bullish breakout level here at the top of the cloud? Right, yeah, Rick says it right here. It's, it's looking much more bullish. It's an improving chart. Technically speaking, according to the cloud, it's in neutral territory right now. But hey, look at this. We're testing near the top of that cloud. Very easily, this could be in bullish territory. Is this something that indicates a trader is going to pick this time to come in and get super short stock and buy that many calls to hedge themselves, right? Not really. We're not really seeing. The chart doesn't really support that way of thinking. And another thing that kind of rules out this trade as a hedge is that it's just so large, right? It is an enormous, enormous trade. How many shares of stock does 14,000 calls give this trader control over? Right? If the stock is, is trading in, in the $7 area, how many shares of stock does that give them control over? Right? If, even if they have a 50 delta, a 14,000 lot of options is over 700,000 shares of stock. Right? This is a pretty clear speculative bet in PMCS. So once I determine that, yes, this is most likely a speculative bet, and yes, this is most definitely an opening position, I then need to figure out if the trade itself fits in with all of my other, you know, kind of risk and reward tolerances and um, uh, whether or not it's something that I can actually then put some risk capital into. And I have to measure my risk in one of two ways, right? I need to either do it as a percentage of my book, as a total dollar amount, but the main question that I'm trying to answer for myself is can I take multiple contracts and still be inside of my risk limit, right? institutions have razor thin margin requirements, right? They don't really have to put up that much capital. And the reason that they don't have to do that is because they don't, you know, they have very easy access to capital and they have a lot more of it than I do, right? So when they buy options, they can take a view on a stock using deep in the money options and put on a massive position with a small amount of capital. If I'm someone who trades with a smaller account, I have to be conscious of how much premium I'm putting on in options contracts. I specifically like to take at least four exit targets in a position. So let me lay out a scenario for you guys and ask you a question. If I have a $10,000 trading account and I don't want to risk more than 5% of my total book in any one position, and I see a big unusual options activity trade come across the tape where options are being bought for two bucks, can I buy a full lot of those and still be inside of my risk parameters? No, I can't, right? So I have to, you know, take trades that set me up for something that I can actually then manage after I am in the position, right? And what's really great about options is that they're very scalable. These came across for 85 cents, right? So for 85 cents, if I only have, um, you know, $10,000 in my account, I can buy a five lot of those, right? And take five different profit targets if I want. If I have a $100,000 account, well, I can buy 50 of them if I want to, right? I can scale into positions very easily because these markets are very, very liquid, okay? So I can really apply this plan to any type of trading account if I'm, a, you know, considered myself to have a smaller account, if I consider myself to have a larger account. I can tailor it to my risk tolerances very easily. But I can also use stop losses when I enter the trade to... <clears throat> help manage that risk even more. And we calculate those stop losses based on options price. So depending on my skill level, I can use these different types of stop losses to help manage my risk in a given position. Uh, a beginner trader who isn't quite used to flagging these types of setups and, and you know, kind of honing in on uh, this type of uh, order flow and identifying 
opening positions or identifying uh, speculative bets versus hedges, they probably don't want to risk too much in a position. So maybe they choose to use a 20% stop, risking a small amount, hoping for a big move to the upside. An intermediate trader can risk a little bit more because you can give yourself a little bit more wiggle room to add to positions on pullbacks and such. And an expert trader shouldn't be using a stop. Now, I personally hate stop losses or the idea of stop losses and options. Um, <clears throat> You know, this is a way for a beginner trader to kind of keep their risk in line. But you still have to understand that with equity options, sizing of positions is very important because even if I have a stop loss, um, I don't necessarily know that that stop loss is going to actually get me out at the price that I chose, right? So let's say I have a scenario like this. Here we have a stock. doesn't really matter what it is, but it's moving higher. And on this day, we close, and I buy some calls. And I say, you know what, I'm going to buy these calls for a dollar. I'm going to use a 20% stop at 80, and I'll put a stop loss at 80 cents. Well, let's say after the market closes on this day, uh, a piece of news is released and a headline comes out that says, hey, uh, you know, the CFO of company XYZ uh, is stepping down because he was just uh, indicted by the federal government for embezzling. All of the books are cooked. You know, think of the worst possible scenario that you can when you're long a stock, right? Whatever that might be, whatever kind of black swan event you can think of. And let's say we come in the next day and the stock is 20% lower and it's down here. Now, did the stop that I put in place at 80 cents mean that I got out of this position at 80 cents? Is anyone going to give me 80 cents on the open the next day when this stock is way down here? for my position, or did I just end up losing way more than what I thought I could with that stop in place? Well, I ended up losing quite a bit more, right? And the reason that this happens is because unlike futures, unlike Forex, equity options and equities markets close at night, right? So there's not open activity where markets can digest news that comes out overnight in individual equities, so it causes them to gap like this, right? So <clears throat> Keep all of that in mind when you're looking at setting stops and when you're looking at how much risk you have in a position. Risk is my number one concern at all times, right? I never, ever, ever want to be in a position where I come in in the morning and half of my account is gone because I didn't manage my risk properly. And fortunately, you know, using this type of trading plan, it's actually pretty easy to do that, right? Institutions are going to take all kinds of trades that a retail trader should never even consider taking, right? They can sell straddles, they can sell strangles, they can sell naked upside calls, they can do a lot of different stuff like ratio spreads because they don't have to pony up that much capital to be in the position and if it really does go against them hard, they have the money to pay up. As a retail trader, I don't have the luxury of being able to do that, right? I need to make sure that at no time I have any type of quote unquote blowout risk on in my book and I'm able to do that by only focusing on the trades that institutional paper is doing that have limited downside. Okay. So time and target, this is actually one of the more important parts of this plan and this is also one of the parts of the plan that beginners who are not used to it find themselves getting tripped up in quite a bit. All right. So what I need to make sure I'm doing is trading the exact same expiration and the exact same strike price as the institutional trader. Today, um, or, you know, um, we saw a lot of institutional order flow in, you know, let's say we see institutional order flow in stock XYZ on the January 100 strike calls. I then look at those calls and say, wow, this order looks great. It's labeled opening. It's volume above open interest. Uh, it is on a very strong chart, so it's pretty clearly a speculative bet. But you know what? Their options are being bought at a dollar and twenty cents. If I buy the Decembers, I can get them for eighty cents. Why wouldn't I do that? Well, as soon as you do that, as soon as you start to tweak the order to save money or to you know have a more aggressive upside target, you're pretty much flying in the face of all of the reasons why you care about this order flow in the first place, right? All of that analysis that we were talking about earlier, all the stuff that goes into a um, institutional trader's analysis before they actually click the mouse and put on a trade is something that arrives at this idea of strike price X, expiration Y, right? 
why would I then come in and say, all right, well, to save a little bit of capital here, I'm going to do a different trade. You're setting yourself up for one of the most uh, frustrating situations that you can imagine. What if that trader bought those January options because they know that a deal is going to go down, but in January? If I buy the Decembers, I might miss out on that. And that's a mistake that I have made in the past, and I promise you I'm never going to do it again. Right, so stick with the institutional trader's flow. Even if you think you might be able to get better value on a different line of options in a shorter expiration or further out of the money strike price, don't do it because you're going to set yourself up for a situation where the catalyst move happens or something happens and the trade that the institutional trader did is a huge winner, but the one that you did goes to zero. And that's a terrible, terrible, very frustrating situation to be in. Okay, so... In case you uh, forgot what happened here in PMCS, this stock absolutely exploded to the upside <clears throat> after this trade hit the tape. Um, the people in our trading room made a huge sum of profits on this name, along with the craft name as well. And, you know, this is not what I want you guys to think is the typical result of trading unusual options activity. Most often what we see are institutional traders making momentum bets using the equity options market. We see it happen in weekly options all the time. We see it happen in short dated options all the time. It's not always a big bet on an M&A play, right? Those are the ones that stick out. Those are the home runs that are the most um, kind of uh, visible when we talk about unusual options activity. But the underlying idea that institutions have better reads on the market and <clears throat> have a better read on momentum in general it's still pretty valid no matter what because those are the guys that are creating the momentum, right? They create the underlying momentum in the market. That's why they have the best view on it. So what I want to do is focus in on the biggest unusual speculative equity options order flow and determine how I can use that to create an actionable signal. And I do that by running it through this plan and then saying, okay, this is something that I want to throw some risk capital at. All right, so I wanted to leave a good amount of time for questions here, so I'm, I'm going to take as many questions as you have, and I, I do see that a couple of them have already come through, but before I do, I want to give you guys a chance to check out um, our live trading room, which is somewhere where we talk about this stuff all day long. We're only offering 50 spots today at a special trial price, but... Um, uh, what we talk about in the trading room and what we provide with part of this subscription is all of our unusual options activity trade alerts in real time via SMS text message and in the live trading room, access to our weekly webinar series where we talk about topics like this and other different um, equity options, futures, forex, and ETF trading plans, uh, private group mentoring on a weekly basis where we have an open forum for you guys to ask as many questions as you want of me and our other moderators on a, on a weekly basis in a less hectic and rushed environment than the regular market hours or trading room. And you get access to our live trading room, which is open from a half an hour before the market opens in the morning, I'm sorry, an hour before the market opens in the morning to a half an hour after it closes every single day with full audio and visual commentary throughout the day. And the best part about all of this is that you get to see our unusual options activity scanner and hear our analysis of the order flow in real time. And we're offering this today for a one month trial for only 27 bucks. All right, so that's less than a dollar a day of fantastic, fantastic value. If you go to our website right now to try and get this, a one-month subscription would be $399. So please, please, please check this out. If you guys want to learn more about trading unusual options activity, this is something that is, you know, kind of like immersing yourself in a place where only a different foreign language is spoken. You're going to pick up on that pretty quickly. We have over 500 active members in the live trading room. <clears throat> talking via open chat all day long. And we offer all this order flow in real time for you guys. So you get you get to see the scanner. You don't actually get to manipulate it yourself. So basically what we have, um, uh, what you get to see all day long is this window that I showed you earlier. We project this in the room all day long. And, you know, if I were just to give this to you without any type of... Uh, you know, uh, background information or setup, you'd probably have a pretty difficult time deciphering everything that's coming across here, right? So really the real value lies in the commentary and analysis and breakdown of all this stuff that comes across in the day that we provide. <clears throat> and all day long, there are market professionals moderating the room, breaking down this order flow and um, uh, talking about these setups. 
right? So someone says, uh, so I'll take any questions that you guys have here. So it's $27 for a one-month trial. Um, it's a fantastic value. I, for $27, I mean, <laughs> you get all day long commentary and analysis for the market. If you are someone who sits at home and trades during the day, um, it's a great way to make it a little bit more interesting and a little bit more fun having a group of people to talk to about markets with all day long. Um, equity options isn't the only focus of the trading room. We actually have moderators that uh, talk about futures, ETFs, and volatility trading as well. Uh, is this the is the price after what is the price after the initial uh, month? Yeah, so it will automatically renew. You are under no obligation whatsoever to take a renewal. If you want to make your uh, purchase today for $27 and then immediately send an email saying that you don't want to renew, that's totally fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. After the initial month, it will renew at $199, which is still a very significant discount from our regular price. You get also get all the a summary of all entries and exits we take in the room emailed to you twice a day and access to the members only section of our website <clears throat> where we have hundreds upon hundreds of hours of recorded uh, content for you to uh, check out and peruse. So <clears throat> it's an incredible, crazy amount of information and access for just 27 bucks. Um, it's a massive, massive discount off of our regular price. If you have any interest in, uh, you know, trading as part of a community or part of a group that is, you know, interested and de dedicated to making uh, navigating a financial markets a little easier, this is the place for you guys. So, any questions that you guys have about anything that we just went over? Um, how do you do with how do you sell options? I'm not really sure what you uh, what you mean by that, Steve. So someone says, um, I have a regular job and cannot day trade or be in the trading room with you guys. What do you offer for people uh, like me or am I out of luck? No, you're not out of luck. So, you know, if you have an interest in learning more about this, you get access to our webinar series as part of this. Those all take place outside of market hours. <clears throat> but you also receive all of our trade summaries as well. So you get to see where all of the order flow, you know, what was going on during the day, what we were trading. And for $27 for the first month, I think that, that there's, you know, a, quite a bit of value in even that stuff. So this is, if there is insider news that XYZ is going to be bought at X price, but the news about CEO breaks before that news, do you think the buying company will adjust their takeout price or let it unfold the way they originally planned. News about CEO. I mean, I guess I would need to know. That's a pretty complex hypothetical. I uh, think I probably need to know a little bit more information about that. Sorry. When you see uh, UOA on a pharma stock like TTPH yesterday, does it usually signal upcoming FDA ruling and insider no? So it depends. When we know there's a catalyst event, um, it will generally lead to a bump in options activity, right? So if the FDA is going to be making a ruling uh, tomorrow, uh, you know, on Monday about drug XYZ from company ABC, everyone knows that that's going to happen. They don't know what way it's going to go necessarily. Maybe some people do. But the opportunity that that move is going to create is going to drive options order flow. So what we're really kind of looking for is out of place, unusual activity, right? Craft, what reason did they have to buy Craft at that time? What reason did they have to buy PMCS at that time? Really none, right? There was no reason, but we saw the activity, and that's what makes it unusual. Uh, so selling options activity, yeah. So there are ways to look at unusual option activity as well. Um, that is big blocks of options being sold. I can use that to build different short premium setups. I can use that to uh, look for exit signals in positions that I already have, and I can use that to... Uh, make determinations on uh, what um, institutional money is expecting out of implied volatility going forward. Do you ever trade leaps? If not, what is the average duration of your options? So that's what's the great thing about unusual options activity trading is, is that institutional traders trade weeklies that expire today. They trade next week's options. They trade, trade next months. They trade next years. They trade options two years out from now. So if I'm a trader that is more so interested in swing trades over the next couple of weeks or so, all I have to do is focus in on the activity that is giving me signals on that time frame. If I'm a day trader, I focus on weekly options activity. If I'm someone who wants to be more of a quote-unquote investor, then I look at leaps activity. Right? So it allows me to look at all different segments and, and kind of uh, motivations in the market and get signals based on where actual money is being bet.
or placed. Make sense? So any other uh, questions, guys? Any other questions? Uh, Realtradeswebinar.com slash alphasharktrading. If you want to check out this offer, we like I said, we have a limited number of spots. We only offer trials to the training room once or twice a quarter. So I don't think that we'll be doing this promotion again anytime soon. This is probably uh, one of our last uh, kind of trial promotions uh, before the end of the year. So if you're interested in uh, you know coming in and, and seeing how this stuff works in real time, uh, please, please, please take advantage of the offer that we have here. Option scans and toss. Yeah, sure. So Thinkorswim's uh, scanner is, is not nearly as robust as, uh, say, the scanner I just showed you guys. But what it does allow me to do, and that's not the right one. I want the I want, uh, ba -ba -ba, option hacker. Here we go. So one thing that I can do very quickly, and they have this built in, and they call it their sizzle index. Why can't I? Anyway, all I have to do is press this button, and boom, it automatically is going to show me the most uh, quote-unquote sizzly stocks that are trading in a day. And all of these multiples here where you see the sizzle index, that's the multiple over the five-day equity options, average equity options volume in a given symbol, right? So basically what we have here is a way to get really granular and filter out <clears throat> what stocks have been trading with unusually large volume. So like on a day where, you know, like a day yesterday where I saw a big move lower in the broader market, you know, if I, what if I wanted to know where market makers were pressing their shorts or where, I'm sorry, where institutional traders were pressing their shorts, I want to know any stock that had, you know, four times its average daily put volume trading. And this is for today, obviously, but I can do this at any given time and get really granular. So today, these are all the stocks that had unusually bearish activity in the equity options market. Once I then have that, I can then go into the time and sales in each stock and see what the trade actually was, right? We, in the trading room, we have this, and this does this in real time. I don't have to set those filters, right? They're automatically programmed in here to find me unusually large options trades, right? Like we can see here, look at this, 10,000 of the GE uh, NOV 38 risk reversals trading here for uh, 775, right? All this gets spit out um, in real time. Alrighty. So any other questions? I probably only have time here for like one or two more questions here. GE, more GE. They've been trading so much of these GE spreads lately. <clears throat> Unbelievable. So just to go over really quickly again what we you get with uh, the trading room, you get access to our weekly webinar series. We talk about uh, topics like this. We do um, a minimum of two webinars a week. You get access to our trade alerts and uh, entries and exits via SMS text message in real time and in the trading room, of course. Access to our private group mentoring sessions that are held in um, rooms just like this where we go over topics and take Q&A sessions for anything you guys want to ask us about. You get access to the live trading room every single day, all day long, and you get to hear and see the scanner and our analysis of the scanner on a daily basis. How often am I in the trading room? I am in the trading room for at least an hour and a half every day, at least an hour and a half every day. <clears throat> the rest of the time in the room is split up by uh, our other moderators. One of them being our founder and CEO, Andrew Keene, who had a 10-year-long career on the CBOE trading floor as an Apple market maker. Um, Tara Begaman, who is a VIX pit veteran from the CBOE trading floor. Webb Begol, who is a developer and um, de uh, programmer of our proprietary indicators, who also goes over technical analysis and setups. And Christian Fromhertz, who is an ex-Merrill Lynch Bank of America ETF and Delta One trader, out in New York who talks about macro flow and uh, institutional trading and ETFs and macro related names. So there's something in there for everybody. We really don't have too many markets that aren't talked about or discussed, not only by our moderators, but by the 500 people that are in the trading room as well. So it's a fantastic community. I absolutely love being in the trading room every day. I have a lot of fun moderating the room and am just I'm constantly amazed and impressed by how savvy our, you know, how savvy 
beginner traders have become after just two or three months in the trading room. It's really, really great to see. And I'm always amazed by the things that those guys, uh, that the uh, people in the room are able to, to master and learn. It's really something that's quite fantastic. Excellent trade room. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I think it's really, you know, we really, really love it, obviously. Uh, no, I did not trade any unusual activity in raw stores. But here, um, I hope you get in the about 40 seconds as well. I'm having a pretty fun day today. Um, trading USO puts that uh, I got into uh, based on unusual options activity. So, any questions that you guys have about um, uh, the trading room, about the offer that we have here, anything that I just talked about, please feel free to shoot me an email, james at alphashark.com. And I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to shoot me an email. Let me know, um, you know, drop me a line and let me know what you thought of the presentation. Let me know, um, you know, what you learned. And if you have any questions about anything, I'd be more than happy to give you more information. So uh, I think that will be uh, closing the I'll probably signify for an hour. Very, very much. Thank you, Nick. So please check out the offer that we have here. You signed up. There. Oh. Oh. Hello. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Maybe it's my internet. Um, sorry, go ahead. You can finish, James. Okay, yeah, so that, like I said, that pretty much wraps it up there. So please check out uh, realtraderswebinar.com uh, slash alphashartrading to check out this, um, uh, check out <clears throat> the uh, offer that we have here. Come into the trading room for $27 for one month. I mean, you're, you're paying less than a dollar a day to get nine hours of audio commentary all day long. Um, and a ton of access to other supplemental materials and information. So even if you don't consider yourself a options person, an options trader, we have a lot of other offerings and we talk about a lot more than just equity options in the room. There's going to be something that's there for you and you'll learn more about options than you ever thought you could in just one month's worth of time. I have a, like um, <clears throat> my, in, my bio said, I have a degree in derivatives trading and financial engineering and I learned more about trading options here at AlphaShark than I did in four years of uh, formal education about it. So please check it out. We look forward to having you guys here. Thank you for all of you who took the offer. Everyone have a fantastic weekend, and as always, happy trading.